I think we're ready to get started here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Mazota, and I'm the co-chair of the annual ACS National SCOTUS Preview. Although we would have loved to have this event in person, we are so glad that you've taken the time and your busy schedule to join us for this virtual program. A few notes about that. The call will be uh, in this Zoom format the entire time. Um, sorry about that, one second. I'm having some technical difficulties already. Um, uh, please make sure that you uh, do not turn your sound on unless you have a question during the Q&A session of the program. Uh, please take some time uh, as we get started to familiarize yourself where the mute button is located at the bottom uh, uh, left-hand corner of the screen and ensure that you are on mute. Uh, we recommend that you switch your view to active speaker view uh, instead of gallery view. Uh, to change your view uh, during the event, go to uh, the top left hand or top right hand corner, excuse me, uh, and then select speaker view uh, in the view options. Uh, if you have questions for the speakers during the event, uh, you can type them in the Q&A box at any time during the conversation or save them until the Q&A section of the call. Today's program includes our speakers, ACS President Russ Feingold and Vanderbilt Law Professor Ganesh uh, Sitaraman. Please be aware that our program has been approved for one hour of Tennessee CLE credit. You will receive an email after the event uh, with instructions on logging your attendance to receive CLE credit. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors of this year's preview, as you can see up on this screen. Um, and uh, as well as Sherrard Rowe as a benefactor, uh, Brandsitter Strange and Jennings as a donor, the Southern Environmental Law Center as a community sponsor, and Byrne For Foreman uh, as an individual sponsor. And finally, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of Justice G Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The past several days have been difficult for all of us and our nation. It goes without saying that she will be deeply missed throughout the ACS community and we thank her for her service to our country. With that, I will hand it over to James Davis. Hi everyone, I'm James Davis, the other co-chair of this event, um, and I'm honored to introduce Russ Feingold. Uh, as most of you know, he served as a senator from uh, Wisconsin from 1993 to 2011, and he was a Wisconsin state senator before that. Uh, while he was in Congress, he distinguished himself as someone who would stand on principle, as he did in opposing the Iraq War, uh, the Patriot Act, and the death penalty. He was a strong progressive voice in the Senate, and yet he had a record of real bipartisanship as well, including co-sponsoring campaign finance reform legislation with Senator John McCain. He's been a law school professor and a diplomat, and this year he became the president of ACS. So we're very pleased to have him here today, and I'll hand it off to him now. Thank you so much. Thanks for the a really nice introduction and uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, you know, uh, doing it virtually may not be perfect, but it, it's a little sign of your spirit that you're willing to keep going and support the organization and, and, and get to connect with each other. Um, and to do it particularly in these challenging times is, is really, really special. I mean, these are exceedingly tough times, especially in Nashville with COVID-19 and the uh, police violence and other incidents of racial injustice, the natural disasters, tornado damage that devastated parts of Nashville earlier this year, the ongoing and increasing threats to the rule of law and democracy, including, uh, as I understand, a recent law about criminalizing protest activity that can threaten one's right to protest and one's right to vote. Obviously, the terrible news of Justice Ginsburg's passing it's a long list. Um, it's a tough time. I'm not going to be one of these older guys that says, oh, you should have seen it back when. I think this might be the toughest I've ever seen. And so the fact that you're willing to go forward, do this, and do all the other things you're doing is to your enormous credit. We thank our ACS leaders for their leadership and commitment to progressive values during this critical time. Thanks to especially James Davis and Will Mazota the ACS Nashville Supreme Court co-chairs, and Kaylee Jennings and Grace Strange, 
the ACS National Co-Presidents, uh, for your tireless work in organizing uh, this wonderful annual event. Thanks to ACS Faculty Advisor and, and Board of Directors and Board of Academic Advisors member, uh, Ganesh Sitaraman, who uh, is taking the time to speak at this event. He is just a, an absolute force within ACS, both uh, just in terms of hard work, but of course, intellectually as well. And I feel privileged to be working with him hand in hand. As background, uh, ACS is of course the nation's largest progressive legal network. ACS believes that the Constitution is of the people, by the people, and for the people. The Constitution and our laws must be interpreted in light of the text, history, and lived experience of our vibrant and diverse country. Our nation's institutions and centers of power should reflect these diverse experiences and work to lift up all people rather than to seek to attack and disenfranchise those who do not have a seat at the table anyway. Through a diverse nationwide network of progressive lawyers and law students, judges, scholars, and many others, we work to uphold the Constitution in the 21st century by ensuring that law is a force for protecting our democracy and for the public interest and for improving people's lives. ACS has spent this summer virtually convening prominent progressive legal voices to grapple with, the, grapple with the formidable issues we are facing today. We really haven't let the pandemic stop us from working with people like you. In fact, in some ways, our work has become broader. We want to ensure that the law is a force for protecting our democracy and improving people's lives. We hope you'll continue to support our work by making a tax-deductible contribution of $5 today. During today's program, You'll hear Ganesh speak about the federal judiciary, the passing of Justice Ginsburg, and the issue of judicial nominations. But let me uh, take a moment to say a few words on this issue. Uh, the legacy of Justice Ginsburg is obvious. It's no exaggeration to say that she was one of the greatest and most influential public servants actually in American history. She's the first woman ever to lie in state in the U.S. Capitol. The process to name her successor should be dignified, though, thorough, and fair. Under no circumstances should the United States Senate consider a replacement for Justice Ginsburg until the inauguration of our next president. Voters in many states are already casting early ballots. To hold hearings in the midst of an election is an insult to the voters who are already choosing the next president. That president, whoever it is, should make that nomination. The Affordable Care Act is before the court again this year, actually supposedly November 10th for the third time, supposed to be the oral argument. It could be struck down completely in the midst of a pandemic, leaving millions without access to health care. States have been very active in trying to further restrict reproductive freedom, and the addition of another anti-Roe justice will accelerate the trend. Overturning Roe, whether in one fell swoop or by cutting back the right it created incrementally, likely means not only sweeping restrictions on abortion in conservative states, but also major new regulations at the federal level that will touch the lives of every woman in America. Furthermore, every issue progressives care about are, is shaped by the court, from voting rights and democracy reform to the environment, to LGBTQ rights, a new, even more conservative court could roll back past progressive victories and do untold damage. Add to the list the right to organize for labor unions and, of course, protecting uh, people's right uh, to vote in the sense of avoiding malapportionment. So we need your help. With the passing of Justice Ginsburg, the court enters a new and perilous phrase of, phase of its history. We as a community of progressive legal professionals have an obligation to help guide the nation through the next phase. We really do have that obligation as the only group that has this kind of national sweep. So we encourage you to draft op-eds on the importance of the courts. People need to hear that in the local communities. Why the Senate should not replace Justice Ginsburg until after the inauguration. Connecting the courts with the lived experiences of everyday people and highlighting the legacy that the courts will have for the next generation. And look, one of the things I hope you discuss in the breakout rooms, and that Ganesh and I will discuss this, even if somehow this does not succeed, 
even if they're able to pull off this terrible thing they're trying to do. Getting that word out, socializing the idea that this is really a crime against the Constitution of the Supreme Court, helps sets the stage for what may have to be very tough action uh, starting next January uh, with, a, with a different government. You are helping make that not seem extreme, but appropriate if you do it. Continue to have conversations on court reform. While ACS does not take specific positions on issues like this, we try to play a lead role in trying to foster the conversation about this with experts across the country like in each. And with regard to the capture of the courts by the right, we're proud, and you know this in Tennessee, uh, that we have 40 working groups across the country, unprecedented process, grassroots process, ready to propose judges based on their record of service to their communities. We are already with some vetted names and we will be ready all across the country with vetted names by November 3rd. We'll be suggesting candidates who are ethnically and racially diverse and diverse in the kind of practice they do, not just corporate lawyers and people that are already judges, but public defenders, community activists, plaintiff's lawyers, people that have represented unions, our list might include all of them, will include all of them, and I hope it leads to them getting on the court. So we'll hope you'll continue to engage with ACS and connect with our nationwide network of progressive advocates, activists, and thought leaders and build relationships that will support you throughout your career. And let me just add as a personal note, although I may not sound like I have any Tennessee roots, my mother was born in Memphis, Tennessee. So I'm going to claim that. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Grace Stranch. I am the co-president of ACS. I have the honor of introducing my friend Ganesh Sudaraman. He is a professor of law at Vanderbilt and the director of program in law and government. He has a long, fantastic resume, but I'm just going to highlight a few of it so we can get on to the program and you can hear all of his amazing things. My favorite is that he was a senior advisor to the 2020 presidential campaign for Elizabeth Warren. He's also, you probably read his articles in the New York Times and Politico, and I would be remiss not to mention that he has a new book out that all of you should check out and support, and it is entitled The Great Democracy, How to Fix Our Politics, Unrig the Economy, and Unite America, which seems more timely than ever. So please take it away. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, uh, Grace. Uh, thank you to Will. Thanks to, to James, uh, Peggy, um, and, and thanks to Russ. Uh, it's really terrific um, that all of you were able, were able to be here and that we could still do this, uh, even though we're in these crazy times with the, with the pandemic. Um, I particularly just want to point out for everyone um, uh, and, and say thanks to Russ, uh, both for joining us uh, here today um, and showing uh, ACS Nationals deep commitment to our chapter here in Nashville, um, but also for all the work that he's already been doing uh, to take uh, uh, the, the helm of this organization uh, at a chaotic time, uh, both with uh, COVID and now um, with all the other crises we face, uh, particularly in the legal context, uh, is really an extraordinary thing. And, and we're really grateful to have, uh, to have Russ's leadership over ACS. Um, so, so thank you to him, and uh, I think uh, you'll all get a chance to ask questions of both of us at the end, and so we'll, we'll hear more from him too uh, as well. Um, I, I thought we would do something a little different for this uh, Supreme Court preview. Um, often we talk about uh, a number of the cases uh, that are coming uh, in the term, and I'm going to talk about a few of them. Um, but given everything that's going on right now, it seems as much of a preview uh, or, or maybe more of the preview that we need is talking a little bit about what's going on right now, what the possibilities might be um, in terms of law and policy uh, for how people in the Senate, how, how all of us might think about what could happen uh, if there is a, uh, if this empty, um, this vacant seat on the Supreme Court is filled. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about that and what some of those options are, and then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the cases that are going to come out this term um, that we know about that are that are quite prominent. Um, so uh, right now we're we're in a really extraordinary position, as as you all know, um, and and it builds off of our recent history. Um, you know, in 2016 uh, there was uh, a death in the Supreme Court. Um, Justice Scalia 
Uh, and almost immediately, uh, Republicans uh, led by Mitch McConnell said that they would refuse to fill that seat, uh, refused to even uh, bring a hearing for any nominee. Uh, and indeed, uh, Merrick Garland, judge on the DC circuit, uh, did not even get a hearing that year, uh, even though he was President Obama's pick for uh, that vacancy on the Supreme Court. Um, now, four years later, with the shoe on the other foot, uh, Republicans have gone in the opposite direction uh, and are saying that they want to put forward and, and uh, confirm a nominee uh, from President Trump uh, with some speed. Um, it is possible that Senate Republicans uh, will uh, have hearings, will even take a vote, um, and may even uh, confirm uh, President Trump's nominee, um, who he says is coming as, as soon as uh, Saturday at 5 p.m. Um, and they could do this potentially before the election, or they could do it after the election during the lame duck uh, session of Congress that happens uh, between uh, the election and, and the end of the calendar year. Um, now, obviously, if, if President Trump wins re-election, uh, whether they do that before or after, or if it's next year, won't make much of a difference because President Trump will still be president. Now, the big change happens, though, if, if President Biden uh, Vice President Biden gets to become President Biden, um, and especially if Democrats win the House and Senate. Um, and I think here what we're going to see and what we've already seen is a lot of pressure on what might happen in that situation and what, uh, in this case, Democrats uh, in the Senate and in the House um, and, and a, a potential uh, President Biden uh, should do. Um, and I think the core thing to start by uh, understanding uh, here that contextualizes the situation um, is what we should expect. And, and the starting point is that we will have a 6-3 conservative court, um, and that this is actually quite an extraordinary thing in our history. Um, it would be the first time in modern history that the divide on the court is along the lines of the partisanship of the appointing president. Now, I'm going to stop for a brief second because that might seem like an extraordinary thing to say. We've had a 5-4 court for a long time. It's been divided along ideological lines. But it's important to remember that that 5-4 court included justices who were appointed by Republican presidents, who sometimes side, who often sided with liberals, Justice Souter, Stevens. Um, so it wasn't cleanly a divide based on the partisanship of the appointing president. In fact, even when Franklin Roosevelt was president, uh, and there were stories about the, the four horsemen um, and, and the justices who were constantly striking down aspects of the New Deal, that included Democratic appointed justices who were on the side striking down parts of the New Deal. Uh, the divide wasn't cleanly partisan, even at that time in the 30s, one of our biggest uh, fights over, over the Supreme Court. So um, this is an extraordinary thing that, that we're gonna see and, and it causes some serious problems. If you believe in the Supreme Court and you think that the court's legitimacy is partly tied in people understanding that what the court is doing is something that isn't just crass partisan politics, it is going to be harder for people to see that that is what is happening when you have divides that are not just ideological, but are explicitly tied to the partisanship of the appointing president. In addition, it's a situation in which uh, given polarization and particularly asymmetric polarization um, on the right, uh, that we should expect that the Supreme Court will make decisions in ways that go against a wide variety of priorities, some of which Russ already noted, um, and policies that progressives tend to favor. Uh, we should expect rulings on reproductive rights, on voting, on workers' rights. Uh, we should expect uh, restrictions on congressional power, uh, the expansion of the unitary executive, the expansion of the what some people have called the neo lochnerian or pro-business, uh, pro-corporate First Amendment. Um, in all of these areas, systematically, we should see a kind of ideological shift that we've already seen over a number of decades, but continue to push forward. And potentially that also puts at risk, if there is a Democratic House, Senate, and President, um, all of the kinds of legislation that we might see uh, those, um, those elected officials pass uh, and the regulations that we might see come out of the executive branch. Um, and so one prospect potentially that we could imagine is that Democrats uh, in Washington and you know, a big chunk of the country, about half the country, um, might see that many of their preferred policies will be struck down regularly by the courts. Um, so I think that is a contextual piece that is 
uh, as a matter of just uh, real politics is partly motivating and concerning to a lot of people. Um, it's also worth just noting how skewed the court appointment situation has been. Um, since 1969, so 50 years, uh, Republicans uh, have picked, and if this, if this next appointment goes through, will have picked 15 of the 19 justices uh, who've, who have uh, been seated on the Supreme Court during that time. Um, so three quarters, more than three quarters of the justices in that time. So it's an extraordinary thing. Last time there were five justices on the court, who, so a majority who were appointed by Democratic presidents was 1968. So more than 50 years ago, so a long time. Um, so this is a big shift. We've had a conservative court for a very, very long time, uh, and, and that will go even farther now than it has been. Um, so what are the possibilities? Um, you've already probably read some, uh, some things on Twitter or in articles um, about what kinds of reforms might be possible uh, and whether reforms are needed. Um, so I, I want to just talk about five different approaches to reform, uh, five specific proposals that, that are out there. Um, the first one, uh, which is probably the one you've heard the most about, is expanding the size of the Supreme Court. So adding potentially four seats to the Supreme Court. Um, now, this is a proposal that uh, has a really big thing going for it, and that it is almost certainly constitutional to do. Uh, the size of the Supreme Court at nine is not fixed in the constitutional text. Uh, the size of the Supreme Court has changed over time. The original Supreme Court was only six moved up to seven, moved back to six, moved to nine, moved to 10, moved to nine. So it's moved around over our history. Um, it's been at nine since 1870, um, but there's nothing saying it has to remain there. And so uh, even though there are some scholars who think that the longstanding historical practice gives it a sense of a constitutional norm, um, th there's no fixed element in our constitution that requires it to be at this, uh, at this uh, current size. And that's something that could be expanded. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, potential arguments that, that uh, go along with, um, with this idea of expanding the size of the courts. Um, one is that it would enable uh, uh, the undoing of these recent appointments um, and allow, in this case, uh, a Democratic president to appoint a number of justices that would most likely um, be more likely to, to make decisions that, that are in, in line with their preferences. Um, and that's something that, that many people have advocated for explicitly for those reasons, um, both nullifying uh, these illegitimate um, practices, but also the kind of affirmative uh, goals for it. Um, one of the downsides that people often raise is that maybe this would lead to a kind of tit for tat uh, forever expanding of the courts. Um, so Democrats will expand the courts by four now. Uh, maybe the next time Republicans are in charge, they'll expand the courts on top of that. And then forever we'll have this never ending cycle uh, of back and forth violence to our court system. Um, that is possible. Uh, I think one thing that we need to think about though, if we're thinking about that is gaming out what the scenarios look like. Um, one possibility is that you have a 100% chance of a 6-3 Supreme Court uh, that is conservative. Um, another possibility is that you have a, a, a more progressive Supreme Court for some period of time, and then the possibility in the future that there's either a kind of new equilibrium um, and that everyone realizes they can live with this, um, or that there's retaliation and that there's a flipping of the court yet again in the future. Um, and different people will come to different uh, uh, views on, on what the risks are of each of those and how much they value uh, the stability of one versus the other, how much they value the risk on a 6-3 conservative court, given what that also means for the substantive uh, concerns. Um, a second proposal that's out there, uh, and really there's, there's two here, is uh, fundamentally changing the structure of the Supreme Court. Um, so I and another uh, colleague of mine teaches at Washington University in St. Louis named Dan Epps um, wrote a paper that's, that's gotten some attention on, on these issues. Um, and, and we've proposed two different things. One is uh, what we call the balanced bench, uh, which is an approach that uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg talked a lot about during the presidential de uh, de debates and, and primary last year. Um, and the idea here is that we expand the size of the Supreme Court to have 15 uh, people on it. Um, five would be Republican, five Democrat, and then those 10 justices would choose five from the Court of Appeals to sit with them for a year. Um, and effectively, they would be sitting by designation. 
Um, that's the idea. And if you're concerned about the constitutionality of something like that, because they haven't been specifically appointed to the Supreme Court, it would be an easy fix for that. You would blanketly appoint all the Court of Appeals judges as associate justices of the Supreme Court formally. Um, and the selection for who gets to sit in what cases would be determined by this uh, kind of uh, uh, the, t the 10 justices choosing the five to sit by designation. Um, so uh, that approach um, has some benefits to it. It recognizes some amount of partisanship, but it also tries to restrict the amount of, uh, of, of influence that partisanship has by forcing 10 justices to choose five that they can agree on. Now, maybe they won't agree on all five, um, but they're going to have to jointly agree to one. Uh, and the stick behind that is if they can't agree, um, then, there, then by statute it will be determined that there's no quorum uh, and they won't be able to hear cases for the year. Um, so if they want to make decisions and help reach finality, uh, which judges tend to, to like being able to, to actually judge, um, they are going to have to come to some agreement on workable lower court justices that they could bring on board for the year. A second proposal um, that we put forward, and this is one that uh, Senator Sanders uh, mentioned uh, during the, the primary debates last year, um, is a panel system akin to what we really have in the Court of Appeals. So on this system, um, we would appoint every Court of Appeals justice to be a, an associate justice on the Supreme Court. Um, the current justices would remain as justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, but the way the Supreme Court, with now 180 some justices on it, would hear cases is in panels of nine chosen by lottery from the total number. Um, and to make sure that there isn't too much radical change in what happens in the cases, now, because you could imagine a random panel of nine might end up having, uh, you know, uh, five conservatives uh, on, on one set of cases and uh, five liberals on the other, and so you get a really destabilized system of law. To prevent that, we would also add a supermajority requirement um, so that you need a 7-2 or an 8-1 even uh, voting um, agreement in order to overturn federal statutes. Um, so, so that kind of proposal uh, would significantly have as a benefit, um, in addition to the 555 plan as well, um, really taking these appointments fights out of the center of our political universe. Uh, it would make appointments to the courts uh, far, far less important, far less of an issue in elections, uh, and make them far, far less uh, a, a kind of political hot button that everybody's focused on. Um, it would make our judges and justices a little bit less of celebrities. Um, and we tend to think that that's a good thing, um, that we shouldn't be trying to figure out who the single justice is, uh, like a Justice Kennedy, and that litigants shouldn't have to direct all of their briefs for maybe years uh, on end uh, toward the idiosyncratic views of a particular justice. Uh, instead, we should want to focus on the law itself. Um, and decentering the court and the particular justices is a good way of, of helping do that. And so we think that's actually uh, a, a feature, not a bug of, of those proposals. Um, a third approach that you've probably heard a lot about as well is the idea of term limits for Supreme Court justices. Um, and the most prominent idea here is to have 18 year terms for justices. The idea is there'd still be nine people on the court um, but that they would each serve for an eight, 18 years, uh, which, and, and you could stagger those terms such that each president then would get two appointees, uh, one for the first two years, one for the second two years. Each Congress would uh, get one judge uh, to, on the Supreme Court to, to confirm. Um, the, the virtue of this plan and, and what people who like it focus on are, are really two things. One is they don't like the idea of justices serving for an extraordinarily long period of time. Um, and, and in particular, they're concerned, uh, uh, and, and in the past have been concerned, though maybe less so today, uh, about uh, the age of justices in some cases uh, in relation to the kind of fast moving issues that are going on and that you, you maybe want people who are not there just for 50 years or longer, uh, in, in, in potentially, I mean, as the, as the age of judges uh, uh, gets younger and younger, uh, in terms of appointees and longevity of life gets older and older, um, these kinds of concerns are things that people are worried about. Um, the other thing that people talk about is that there's a benefit to having some regularity in appointments instead of the unpredictability of appointments. Uh, this approach, though, does have some downsides, um, and I'll just highlight three of them. Uh, to the extent that what you're concerned about is the extreme partisan battles and these kind of 
uh, knock down um, bloody fights that we have over appointments every time that there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, uh, it is unlikely that the 18 year term approach will solve these problems and it arguably might make them even worse than they already are. Um, and, and here's how to think about that. Uh, an 18 year term structure guarantees that every single election, every presidential election and every single midterm election will partly be fought over the Supreme Court because there will always be a Supreme Court nominee every single two years to be confirmed. Um, so the court will be a central feature of our electoral politics uh, indefinitely under this structure. Second, it's unlikely that people will still think the court is unimportant or less important or that each justice uh, isn't going to be important. And so the confirmation battles are likely to be just as fierce as they are, unlike, for example, in the lottery or the 555 plan, where really the court of appeals is where a lot of the game is in those approaches. Um, and there's just so many more judges that it's harder to have constant fights over them. Um, the third problem is that it might be that, we, sh that we, we could see a Supreme Court that actually gets more political in its decision making. Uh, one of the challenges of term limits is that the people who are serving in office start wondering what they're going to do after they're in office. Uh, and I'm sure, um, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky to have, to have Russ at our helm who's, who's remained a public servant and, and an educator in his time uh, after office, and he, he maybe w wouldn't want to talk about some of his colleagues, but, but there are some who serve in Congress, um, uh, who you're all aware of, I think, who instead would choose to cash in and become lobbyists. Uh, and we might expect Supreme Court justices to cash in to say become uh, commentators on Fox or MSNBC, uh, to become lobbyists or to start their own Supreme Court practices at big law firms in DC, uh, or um, who might even use the opportunity of the platform to run for office themselves, perhaps even making a run for the presidency. In fact, we've had justices in the past who've wanted to run for president, uh, and, uh, and at least historians looking into those justices and their, and their decisions have found um, that their decision, decisions changed significantly uh, from the time when they were actively considering running for president and the time that they realized that that wasn't going to happen and that they made peace with just staying on the Supreme Court. Um, so there's a question of do we really want justices who are looking to their next job uh, when they're making decisions. So that's the 18 year uh, term uh, and some of its pros and cons. Um, there are some constitutional issues there too. We, we could talk about those and the constitutional issues on the, on the changing of the structure altogether um, uh, if folks are interested during Q&A. Um, okay, a fourth topic. Um, uh, you're really getting your, your, your CLE here with this, uh, with this lecture on all of this. So fourth topic is jurisdiction stripping. Um, one of the things that some commentators have suggested is you could still have a 6-3 Supreme Court uh, that's conservative, um, but Congress is empowered to strip the jurisdiction of the court on a variety of issues uh, and just not allow the court to adjudicate those issues. Um, this is a controversial position uh, for constitutional reasons in part because while there's some arguments that you can do this, it is generally considered by scholars to be one of the most unsettled and un unknown answers uh, in federal courts. Um, people don't really have a good sense of what the scope and limits of such, uh, of Congress's ability to do this are. Um, it's not settled and so that would be something that would be litigated heavily um, and would lead to some serious clashes between Congress and the courts um, on a fundamental question. Um, that said, uh, what proponents of jurisdiction stripping offer as, the, as a great value to this approach um, is that the Supreme Court has taken on an extraordinarily outsized uh, place in our political system, um, one that it did not actually have at the founding um, and throughout much of the 19th century. So for most of the 19th century, the Supreme Court was not as central uh, as it is today. People didn't use phrases like judicial supremacy, uh, and the court didn't really strike down as many federal statutes as it does now. Um, in the 20th century, the Supreme Court has taken more and more power for itself. Um, it has expanded its authority. It regularly is at the center of some of our most hotly contested political fights uh, in a way that it was not really intended to be the central, uh, a central player uh, in policy and political debates. Um, so part of what advocates for jurisdiction stripping say is that we're actually returning to a more democratic a way of viewing the court is that the court should have a more limited role um, and that jurisdiction stripping uh, could serve that purpose. Um, people in this camp also support uh, supermajority requirements like the one that I talked about earlier. 
um, as another version of this, raising the bar for when the court can overturn the decisions of, uh, of the political branches uh, is in deference to democracy. Uh, and it channels for people who are interested in uh, political policy, social change, it channels their efforts into the elected branches of government, into the political process, rather than channeling them into the courts. The last category of reform that I'm gonna talk about is um, legislative review of courts. So this may seem like a striking thing. How can the legislator, how can legislators review courts? The courts are the final word. They get to say what the law is, uh, famously. Um, well, it turns out in a lot of other countries, that's not how it works. Um, there are actually countries, our, our neighbors to the North, Canada, for example, have a provision that allows the legislature to review decisions of the Supreme Court and uh, overturn them. Um, and that is something that we could do by constitutional amendment. You could change the structure of the Constitution to say that decisions of the Supreme Court are not final, but that a supermajority of Congress uh, could go back and overturn uh, those constitutional decisions. That is a possibility. Um, obviously, constitutional amendment is difficult, so I think that is uh, not likely to be something that comes up uh, in the first half of, of next year. Um, more likely is a second option, uh, which uh, is something I've called a Congressional Review Act for the Supreme Court. Um, it turns out that, uh, as you all know, um, statutory decisions that, a, that the Supreme Court makes are not fixed forever. They are things that Congress can overturn because they're simply decisions about statutes. And Congress can rewrite its statutes anytime it wants as long as they're in line with the Constitution. Um, so one possibility is that Congress could pass a statute akin to the, to the, uh, uh, to the Congressional Review Act, which is a, a review act that applies toward agency regulations um, to court decisions on statutory questions. And that would create a fast track process that would require Congress to consider any Supreme Court statutory decision uh, and take a look at it and decide whether they want to overturn that statutory decision and write different statutory language. There's a lot of details in that kind of a proposal, uh, but it's a way to, to give some check on a court. So um, those are five different categories of reform proposals. I suspect you'll be hearing more about all of them as we go forward over the course of the next weeks and months. Um, and we could spend more time in the Q&A or in the breakout sessions discussing those if, if those are of interest. Um, so as part of the preview for this year, though, I did also want to flag a couple of cases um, that are important. Um, and I'm just going to highlight three of them uh, that you might want to have on your radar. Um, the first one actually follows really nicely from thinking about the structure of the Supreme Court and possibilities for court reforms. Uh, and it's a case called Carney versus Adams. Uh, and it comes out of the Third Circuit, um, really about Delaware. So Delaware's constitution has partisan balance requirements that prevent the governor from packing the courts with judges of one political party. So for example, the five person Supreme Court in Delaware, uh, the constitution says that three members have to come from one party uh, that we can call like the bare majority provision. So uh, three out of the five, um, but the other two must come from, and I quote, the other major political party. Uh, so the idea here, way back in 1896, when they wrote this provision, is that the people of Delaware decided in their constitutional uh, revision process, they didn't want to have judicial elections because they were worried that was going to politicize the judiciary too much. Um, but they also uh, didn't want to have a system where one party could dominate. And so they created this partisan balance system. And they put in this idea of the other major political party provision as an anti-circumvention rule. What they didn't want to happen was for someone uh, to basically at the last minute flip their party affiliation uh, to independent or to some third party uh, from being a Republican or a Democrat and then allow the governor to put, the, pack them, up, put them on the court as well. Um, so it had to be from different parties uh, as a way to protect against that. Um, the case uh, is uh, about a guy named Adams who uh, wants to be on the court, um, is an independent, and says that this provision prevents him from getting uh, a spot on the court uh, as an appointee 
Um, and this applies not just to the Supreme Court, it applies to a variety of courts in Delaware, just to use that as an example. Um, but he can't apply for any of these court positions because he's an independent. Um, there's a couple of different disputes that issue in this case. One is a set of standing questions. Um, you know, he, he had applied in the past uh, 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 when he was a Democrat um, and said, and he himself has said that there were only Republican slots, uh, but there were actually Democratic slots available too. So there's some debate about the facts uh, in the case and whether he is standing as a result. Um, at present, uh, he is an independent, but he hasn't applied uh, for any positions on the courts. So there's a question of, uh, again, standing there. Um, there's also a First Amendment issue, and I think that's the, the core kind of merits question that people are interested in with this case. Um, and the argument here is that employment is being decided based on partisanship, and he's being excluded for his partisanship, uh, his partisan affiliation. Um, and there's a set of cases, one's called Elrod, one's called Branty, um, but in these set of cases, uh, the Supreme Court has said the First Amendment um, does have some limits on partisan uh, affiliation requirements um, for low-level public employees. Um, so you can't require low-level public employees uh, to, to, it's okay for a state to have a rule saying that low-level public employees can't have a, a partisan fil affiliation. Um, but it distinguished between that and policy-making positions. Um, and those cases are something of a mess. Uh, the Elrond case has a, is a very fractured opinion, um, but everyone in the case, all the justices in the case were clear that policy making was different than low level public employees. And so one of the arguments that the state of Delaware here is making in order to preserve uh, its partisan um, balance requirements uh, relies on another case called Gregory versus Ashcroft uh, in which uh, the, they, the, the Supreme Court notes that and, and, the, and, and the state of Delaware is, is leaning into, um, that state court judges uh, who, may, who decide common law questions um, are in policy-making positions uh, because the common law is a policy-making kind of a role. Um, they also argued that the standard, the First Amendment standard uh, in a case like this should be slightly lessened because the state decision uh, on how it wants to organize itself should be respected by the federal courts uh, out of respect for federalism um, and the states being able to determine uh, how they organize themselves uh, in terms of their own constitutional structure. Um, but they also argue that even if the standard is higher, even if it's strict scrutiny, they think this is narrowly tailored uh, and part of the respect that everyone has for the Delaware courts, and they cite uh, pretty heavily here um, the role that Delaware plays in corporate law, um, is because they have this balanced system. Um, and, and I raise this case as an important one. You know, this is sort of an obscure constitutional law question normally, but this year, in a year where people will be deciding and debating questions about potentially putting partisan balance requirements into the Supreme Court or how we might think about restructuring the Supreme Court, I think this case may be an interesting one um, and may have some uh, tea leaves within it that, that could be read on how justices on the court think about these kinds of provisions. Um, a second case uh, that I'll flag, and, and that also really raises some of the stakes about what may be at issue with the court, uh, a 6-3 court this year, is called Fulton versus Philadelphia. Um, so the facts here, uh, Ful uh, Philadelphia requires that foster agencies refrain from discrimination, including discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, when they're performing government services or exercising delegated government powers. Uh, and that includes, uh, for example, evaluating possible foster parents. Uh, in Philadelphia, Catholic Social Services um, for, for many years has done work on foster uh, issues, um, including evaluating foster parents. Um, it has stopped in the last couple of years, um, and it wants a contract now with the city, but without this non-discrimination provision because the Catholic uh, Social Services position uh, is uh, not in line with the non-discrimination rules with respect to sexual orientation. So the question is, is this a compulsion of speech um, is how Catholic Social Services raises it. They feel that their speech is being compelled in this case, uh, requiring them to take certain positions that are not in line uh, with their free exercise of their religion. So speech question and a religion uh, question combined here. Um, 
this raises some big questions. Um, Catholic Social Services in the case uh, is actually asking whether the case of Employment Division versus Smith should be overturned. Um, for those of you who maybe don't remember your First Amendment uh, uh, case or, or haven't uh, uh, done a, firm, a First Amendment uh, issues in a long time, um, this is a, a landmark case um, from many, many years ago uh, in the 80s by Justice Scalia. Um, and what the case says uh, very briefly is that uh, it is permissible for the government to enforce laws that burden religion if those are generally applicable and neutral laws. Um, and so uh, this is a case that a lot of uh, precedent is built on, a lot of doctrine is built on, um, and actually a lot of statutes are built on top of including the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, so that's a big constitutional issue in, in the case. Um, in addition, there's also just the, the obvious question um, uh, that the facts, I'm sure, made you all uh, notice right away, which is about whether there should be an exemption uh, from these non-discrimination rules based on religious uh, preferences of religious organizations. A couple of distinctions to look out for in the case in terms of how it gets framed and where a court might go. Um, one is this case is a little bit different from a number of other cases because it's not about a regulation by the government. The government's not regulating Catholic services to do anything or to not do anything. What it is, is the government acting as a contractor. The government is choosing not to do all of the foster parent evaluations on its own, but instead is contracting out to other actors to do some of that work. Uh, and those contracts have conditions attached to them. So difference here between um, regulation by the government versus simply performing services for the government under a contract. That's one to look out for. Um, another is the point from Smith, uh, Employment Division versus Smith, which is that the requirement here is neutral. It's generally applicable to everyone uh, who they contract with. Um, they're not specifically targeting any particular religious group or other group uh, in the process. Um, an alternate framing coming from Catholic uh, services is the city is allowing a contract, uh, would allow the contract uh, with someone of different religious views. And so their argument is because of that, it is discriminating itself on the basis of religion. Someone who had different religious views would not, would be able to get a contract. They are not able to get a contract because of their religious views. Okay. So really goes back to some very classic First Amendment questions going all the way back to Employment Division versus Smith, um, uh, an important case to look out for. Um, and that's coming, uh, coming quite soon in, in October uh, in terms of the oral argument. Um, the third case is one that Russ mentioned uh, when we started off, and that's California versus Texas. Um, this is going to be heard uh, the week after the election, um, and it is yet another Affordable Care Act case. Um, and if you thought there were not any more possible ways that one could challenge the Affordable Care Act, you were wrong because they have found yet another way to try to challenge it um, after these many, many years. Um, okay, so what's the issue in this case? In 2017, you may remember the, the, the Senate, the House the president passed a bill called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, and what, the, what this big tax cut did in part was it made the penalty under the Affordable Care Act to be zero dollars if you do not comply with the mandate to purchase health insurance. So quick, re quick reminder, under the Affordable Care Act, originally 2010, there was a mandate for people to buy health insurance. If you did not purchase health insurance, there was a penalty. Penalty was enforced through the IRS. This was at the core of the 2012 Supreme Court case, NFIB versus Sibelius, which was the first big case that looked at the ACA. In that case, five justices said that the mandate for people to purchase health insurance was unconstitutional under the Commerce Clause. But a different five, well, four were different, Roberts was the same between the two sides, said that this mandate was constitutional as a tax under the taxing power. Okay, so fast forward to today. The argument in this case is from those challenging it, which is Texas, DOJ, and a whole bunch of other states, um, is that 
given that the penalty has been zeroed out, you can't say that the mandate to purchase health insurance is a tax because there is no tax penalty, it's zero. So as a result, the mandate isn't constitutional as a tax because it's not a tax. Recall, it's also not constitutional under the Commerce Clause. So if the mandate, they say, is unconstitutional, then they then make another argument. They also say that it is inextricable from the rest of the ACA. The mandate was so central to the design and structure and functioning of the ACA that therefore it is inseparable from the ACA and because the mandate is unconstitutional, because there's no longer a tax, it's no longer a tax, the entire ACA must be unconstitutional. The part is inseparable from the whole, the part is unconstitutional, therefore the whole is unconstitutional. That's the basic syllogism. Okay, so that's a lot of background. Um, the basic legal part of this question is about severability doctrine. So severability doctrine is basically uh, when do we sever out one part of the statute and uphold the rest of it versus striking down the whole statute when one part of it is unconstitutional. Um, this is in general, there is a very, very strong doctrine here against striking down entire statutes because one portion of the statute is unconstitutional. Very strong presumption in that favor. Conservative justices, Roberts, Kavanaugh, have said this uh, and created a very strong presumption uh, uh, of severability, uh, meaning you just strike out that one unconstitutional provision rather than the entirety of the statute. Um, in fact, the, the, the doctrine is so strong that um, some congressional drafting manuals on how to draft a statute actually don't advise that a severability clause, an explicit statement of severability, um, is even needed. Uh, they don't say you should always put in a severability clause because of the severability problem. It's just the assumption is, you know, this is, this is a strong doctrine. Uh, it's unnecessary. So some statutes um, do have severability doctrines, uh, severability um, uh, clauses. Many of them do, in fact. So Dodd-Frank, the, the statute on financial reform passed in 2010, uh, which was at issue um, this past year in the case called SALA Law, uh, which is about the constitutionality of the structure of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, is that constitutional because it has a single director who is not removable um, at will by the president? Uh, that statute has a severability clause in it, explicitly says that if any one provision of this statute is severable, we want the rest of the statute to hold, uh, even if you strike down one part of it. Uh, the Supreme Court then strikes down just the portion that says that you know, the, the, the head of the CFPB uh, cannot be fired um, or can only be fired for inefficiency and neglect uh, in office or malfeasance. Um, so what that means is that the CFPB head can be fired for any reason whatsoever by the president. Just strike down that one provision. Don't strike down the whole CFPB. Don't strike down the whole of Dodd-Frank. The Affordable Care Act does not have an explicit severability statute. That, however, as I said, does not mean that the whole statute has to be struck down. There's a strong presumption of severability, even without such a clause. What the Department of Justice and, the te and, and Texas and these other states are arguing is that Congress itself indicated that it thought the mandate was so essential to the whole structure for it to work that you have to strike it down, that it overcomes any presumption because Congress thought that this was a core part of the ACA. So that's the argument there. Um, we've already gone over with some of the counter arguments. Uh, well, we haven't, I haven't said explicitly. The counter arguments are uh, on the policy side that actually, you know, this is an extremely strong bar. Uh, Congress does not say explicitly that it wants the whole thing to be struck down if part of this is struck down. Um, and we've had some years now of this thing working and moving through that are evidence that the whole system works uh, even in the absence of a mandate uh, and even in the, ab uh, in the absence of a mandate that has the penalty attached to it. So we have a few years of that too. So there's a number of arguments that, that are gonna be raised um, uh, on those grounds. 
Um, I'll, I'll just make one small note. Um, in other cases, uh, Justices Thomas and Gorsuch have suggested that the thing to do is not to strike down the whole statute or to rewrite the statute is what they say by striking out a portion of the statute that's unconstitutional. Instead, the thing to do is to decline to enforce the offending position uh, provisions. Um, if something is unconstitutional, we should just not enforce it at all. Um, so that's their position. That'll apply different ways in different cases, um, but that's been their general view. Um, so, you know, I, I flagged some of these cases uh, for you both just to give you a preview of what, what's coming this year, some of what the big ticket uh, political items are. Um, but just to bring it back uh, to where we started, um, it really raises the stakes for what's at issue right now with this nomination. And I think Russ uh, started us along these, uh, along these lines. Um, big questions around speech, around religion, around healthcare in the middle of a pandemic. Um, are all going to be at, at issue in this in this uh, in this appointment and this year um, and going forward with the question of how should we think about the structure of the Supreme Court going forward um, and and just because it's a, a thing that I've written some about it, I just want to leave you with one last big picture question to chew on um, which is why does it make sense to have the design of a of an institution of extraordinary importance in our constitutional and political system uh, for which everything with how it operates and all the decisions it might make which shape all of the federal courts and the constitution and the rule of law in this country turn on the random timing of things like the age and passage of a particular justice. Uh, is this any good way to run a country? Um, and should we think about the structure of the Supreme Court um, not just in terms of these appointments, but in terms of what's a sensible way to come up with a design for how an organization that is one of the important branches of our government should actually be built. Um, and I would suggest that our current uh, structure uh, has for a long time, independent of this particular vacancy, uh, has for a long time not made much uh, logical sense, uh, given how much turns on these very, very um, uh, uh, random occurrences in many cases, um, or idiosyncratic ones in the case of justices choosing when they want to retire. Um, so with that, um, I'll stop and uh, I'm excited for your questions. Uh, and I think Russ will be as well, uh, too. Thanks. Ganesh, so we are now in the Q&A portion of our event. I don't see anything in the chat box, but I'm hoping you are all just holding on to your questions. Um, Russ, do you have a question? <laughs> um, you are on mute, but if you want to ask the first question, I saw your hand raised. I have lots of questions for the last speaker, but um, <laughs> you tell me how you want to proceed. You have the floor. <laughs> if you don't mind, that was just a, a brilliant presentation. I wish every single member of ACS could hear that, that description of these alternatives. Let me just kick it off while we wait for other people and just have you talk a little bit about one of the things you mentioned, which is the, the idea of requiring a super majority uh, for the Supreme Court to overturn something. You know, as somebody that was a legislator for 28 years, uh, as I look at that idea, it, it depends on the day. You know, if we're talking about DOMA, uh, you know, striking down DOMA, which I voted against, Defensive Marriage Act, you know, I would have been very pleased that it wouldn't be a super, uh, require a, a super majority. But when it comes to some of these measures that were passed after 9-11 uh, that I thought were thoughtless, whether it was about torture or Guantanamo, you know, requiring a, a super majority to strike down a reckless act of Congress cuts the other way. So I'm just wondering how, how you feel about this idea of having a supermajority requirement? So this is a really deep question, and, and I think it gets to a, a very big question, which is, what is the role that we want the court to have in a democracy? Um, and, you know, I think for, for many liberals, and I use that term specifically, not uh, progressives, but for many liberals, um, and particularly liberals of the mid-20th century, uh, the courts were a vehicle for social change. 
uh, a path toward progress to a more just and more equal society. And I think the Warren Court was the best example of this and I think is the, is the paradigm that people have in mind. Um, it's worth noting though that the Warren Court made maybe decisions that liberals liked for about 13 years from 1955 to 1968. Um, but pretty much for the entirety of the history of the country, otherwise, the Supreme Court has not been particularly favorable to the views of uh, workers, uh, immigrants, minorities um, across the board. In fact, uh, you know, we have the Lochner era, an era where the court is significantly pro-business. Um, you could think back to the Chinese exclusion cases and, and see uh, a court that is not terribly uh, favorable on a variety of uh, racial and immigration questions. Um, obviously, there was Dred Scott. Um, so, you know, th there's a range of cases, uh, 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 Plessy, um, where, where the courts have not been really in favor of that. And I think there's a question for a lot of people, which is, do you still have uh, or, or have a liberal hope that we want courts to affirmatively be a site for social change and that we think that they should be doing that? And if so, you might want a court that can strike things down some more. Um, and the idea of a counter-majoritarian court, a court that can strike down the unjust decisions of Congress, is putting faith in a court that is on the side of protecting minorities, is, is on the side of justice where the majority might be tyrannical. There's another concern, though, the flip concern. Maybe the minority is tyrannical, and the majority is not that tyrannical. In that case, you might be worried about a small number of people on the Supreme Court who have extraordinary power and are skewed in who they are and what their preferences are and their ability then to strike down the views of the majority one after another after another. Um, and that could even be to preserve their own power or the power of their own party or interests that they're aligned with vis-a-vis um, -vis the interests of the large majority. So um, I think, you know, Russ, your question really gets to this very, very hard point, which is where do you want to draw that line and how do we want to think about that? I think for proponents of something like supermajority requirements, their general view is we should not see the Supreme Court as a site and vehicle for making political and social change. If you want to make change, get in the street, get some people elected, get them into Congress and make Congress rewrite the bills. Um, that's, what, that's what those people would say is we should channel our energy not into activist litigation, but we should channel it into politics. Um, the counter argument is, you know, we might not do as well at politics, we might not win, maybe we want a court that has that role. Um, that's one set of arguments, that's the classic counter-majoritarian set of arguments. The other argument, though, is maybe we just want different kinds of checks. You know, it's a good thing to have a few checks, not just one, which is, uh, you know, or, or actually we have two. You got you to get something passed in the House, you got to get it passed in the Senate, the president's got to sign it. So we got, we got three different bodies that have to agree there. Um, maybe we want a fourth, you know, maybe we also want the court to agree. Um, so you might just support it on the variety of kinds of checks that we have in the system. Uh, you might also support it because you think you have a, that there's a counter-majoritarian argument. But this is the real debate is, are you more worried about tyranny of the minority on the court or are you more worried about tyranny of the majority in Congress? Yeah, and in that regard, uh, you know, as I think about you know, something I mentioned, something you mentioned as well, is the generational impact here. If, if they're going to put all these 30, 40 somethings on the court for the next 40, 50 years, and this incredibly diverse country is electing both houses and senates that are, you know, far more in tune with the problems of the country. Uh, I've never taken a position on this idea, but I, you know, it strikes me that requiring a supermajority would at least make it harder for, you know, what what Roosevelt I think called what the nine old men or what was was that the term uh, to to frustrate um, the gen generation that's watching a lot of this today with us. It, it would make it harder for them to to do that, but you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, well, one of the one of the interesting asymmetries here that's that's that I think is really interesting on the age question, especially is you know there was a time when people were really worried about justices, you know, uh, who were who were um, uh, a little bit older who might not know as much about the internet, who might not use smartphones or computers as well, and were going to be deciding these important cases on surveillance and privacy and so on, uh, and and thought younger justices 
you know, that, that, that was the thing people were, were a little concerned with. One thing that's kind of interesting um, is conservative justices and judges, uh, especially the ones in the Court of Appeals, many of them are quite young. There's, there's judges now in their 30s and uh, their 40s. So to some extent, the, the age concerns um, are in a way mitigated by the fact, at least now, that conservative judges have picked people who are young, might have some knowledge of these things. So that's not really as good an argument. Uh, interestingly, you know, Democratic presidents, um, uh, both uh, Clinton and Obama, but since it's more recent, Obama, uh, have not picked judges uh, who are as young as those that the, the, the Republican presidents in recent years, Bush um, and, and Trump, have chosen. Um, so there's an interesting age asymmetry. Um, there's also a weird feature that if you put a number of young people on the Supreme Court, uh, or young-ish, let's say in their 40s, um, the, the, any age concerns don't actually manifest to the extent that they do in terms of being generationally out of sync with, say, technology or something like that, uh, until 30 or 40 years from now. So it, it'll be quite some time. And it, so, so I think in some ways, things like 18-year terms or concerns that might have some implicit age question or how in sync are you with the times um, don't really have as much uh, strength now as arguments um, uh, than they might have, uh, you know, maybe a decade or more ago when, when I think people were, were looking at cases about surveillance and technology um, and, and, and were a little more concerned about those issues. No, and that's certainly in the context of uh, losing a wonderful 87-year-old justice. Uh, I think most of us could care less what she knew about technology is <laughs> that her, her nature was so great. And the other thing is that I, I have some real strong sympathy about the issue of, of these individuals serving for such a long period of time. But I noticed because I filed the death penalty through, throughout my entire life, as, an, as you know, as a number of these older conservative justices got older, they could, they quote, could no longer tinker with the machinery of death. They changed their views as they mellowed and got older. So, you know, this really is complicated. Peggy, you got some questions? I do. I have two in the queue. So the first is, with the SCOTUS reform proposals that rely on circuit court judges, are we not concerned that higher stakes for those appointments won't cause as much of a partisan fight as SCOTUS appointments do? And is there a concern about the number of judges that Trump has appointed to the circuit courts and how they largely skew conservative now? Yeah, so I think for the, for the proposals out there, um, the lottery proposal or the, the balanced bench proposal, um, these are, are both concerns. Um, so the first is certainly uh, it's the case that um, there would be some heightened interest in court of appeals appointments. Uh, the question, though, that you know, uh, uh, Professor Epps, uh, uh, my co-author on this issue, um, and, and I pose is, how big is that delta? Does it really make a difference? And, and the argument here is that, in fact, what we have already seen on the conservative side is complete polarization and uh, understanding of the Court of Appeals as a site of a political battle on the order of Supreme Court nominations. This is why you have people being nominated who are 37 years old uh, onto the courts um, in, in put into some of these places um, and who are have kind of backgrounds that are, you know, Federalist Society approved and have been through a certain set of uh, metrics. Um, and, and so th this has already happened on one side. Uh, it has not happened to the same degree among Democratic uh, uh, legal elites, I would say, um, including during the Obama administration. We'll have to see if there's a Biden administration, how they how they approach these questions. Um, but there is a, uh, uh, there's been a difference there. So I, I think the delta is probably not that much. If anything, uh, it may actually rebalance the asymmetry a little bit because there's already uh, uh, a pretty serious understanding on the right, but not one as much on the left. So it might actually make people on the left more concerned about the Court of Appeals. Um, so, so that's one part. Um, a second is what, what about all the appointments so far? Now, uh, I didn't mention this is one of the options, but there has also been a number of people who've made arguments about expanding the size of the federal courts um, uh, outside of the Supreme Court, uh, both district court judges and, and court of appeals judges. Um, and for a couple of reasons, one, um, you know, the, there are some who make it for political reasons on the grounds of just uh, having more democratic judges. 
Um, but there are many others who actually make the arguments not based on that, um, but based on uh, the, the fact that, you know, we have a large and growing country. Um, we expand in size and our population. Um, but in fact, we do not always expand the courts to, uh, to, to manage the size of our growing country. Um, and so there's actually a strong argument to expand the size of the courts in order to reduce the workload uh, of judges um, and expand the responsiveness of the courts uh, to the kinds of caseload and, and casework uh, that a swift um, and efficient system of rule of law uh, would require uh, to be just and fair. And so, um, so there's a strong argument just on the, uh, on, on it's important to actually have um, a more workable uh, court system uh, to, to expand out the size as well. Uh, Judge Strange, we saw that you unmuted earlier, so I want to give you an opportunity to unmute and ask your question. Oh, you're still on mute. I think okay. you're on mute now. Is that it? Okay. How are you? Um, I, I was wondering if it might not politicize the decision making of the courts of appeals if people are to be chosen even for a single term. Um, you can see politi you can see politi how political things have gone in the recent appointments, but if in fact people are all, all of the Court of Appeals just judges are um, associate justices, then might that not impact the way the Courts of Appeals decide their cases? I mean, auditioning is fairly common now for the Supreme Court. Do you think that won't enhance that problem? So great question. Um, I do think it will potentially uh, change how Courts of Appeals judges uh, act, but it's not clear in what way. Um, and, and here's what I mean by that. Uh, if 10 in our balanced bench, and I'll do it for each of the two, in our balanced bench system, if um, five Democrats, five Republicans have to choose five uh, Court of Appeals judges, if they decide that they want to each get two more of their own team and they're just going to compromise on one, then maybe it's favorable to be one of the ones who's a liberal or is a conservative, so you get picked up by your own team. But maybe you want to start writing a lot of opinions that are sort of in the middle and kind of, you sometimes go this way, you sometimes go that way. On some issues, you're more conservative. On some, you're more uh, uh, liberal um, in order to try to be that consensus judge that, that might get picked up um, by one of the justices. So it's unclear to me how this might shape opinions. It could be better, it could be worse. Um, but we've also put in another point here, another protection here, which is uh, once picked to do this for a one year slot, um, you can't do it again for five years. Uh, so it's possible that judges might would still do some of this work uh, knowing that they might be up again in five years time. Um, but there's a little bit of a protection there in the sense that uh, the, the justices can't constantly be picking the same people um, and, and they can't reward those who they served with this year uh, until another five years later, in which case the 10 might have changed um, and any number of other things could have changed in the process. So, um, so that's part of, part of a protection built in. On the lottery system, there's some interesting dynamics here too. Um, one thing that we think about the lottery um, is that uh, I, obviously it's not the case that the judges would change their opinions because they'd just be chosen by random lottery. Um, but with, you know, we built into that a requirement, not just for uh, a super majority, but also a partisan balance requirement based on the appointing presidents. So you couldn't have more than five of the same uh, judge uh, of the same uh, party uh, who appointed you um, picked in through the lottery um, to address some of the partisan issues. Um, but one of the benefits that this might have actually, we think um, in the proposal, we suggest that people would serve uh, only for two weeks at a time. They would hear two weeks of cases. You could spend the rest of the year writing your opinions. You could take a long time writing the opinion, but you only do two weeks of sittings at a time. And then it moves to a different panel for the next two weeks. Uh, and what that would mean is that basically all the justices in the lottery system would be sitting at home You'd be sitting back in Nashville or Denver with your colleagues who are Court of Appeals judges. Uh, and yeah, you'd have a couple of cases that are Supreme Court cases, but you'd normally be just working on your regular docket with your regular clerks. Um, and one of the benefits we think about this is that the culture of uh, judges is different than the culture of justices. Um, the justices are very uh, um, 
uh, aware that, uh, you know, in, in the words of, one, of, of uh, you know, I heard a story once about um, someone who referred to, to, to swing justice as a walking constitutional amendment. Um, but, they're, but they're aware of their role as uh, deciders of, of these kind of big questions. And, you know, I think some people think that this goes to their head a little bit as well. Um, whereas Court of Appeals judges on, are a little closer to the ground, uh, understand that they have to deal with real cases that, that the Supreme Court um, needs to actually give some guidance on what judges are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and that actually the kinds of opinions we might get out of uh, this kind of system could be very different. Um, maybe a little bit more humble, maybe a little bit more tied to what's actually uh, being decided, uh, maybe with a little bit better guidance for their fellow colleagues uh, because they are the ones um, uh, dealing with those cases on a day-to-day -day basis and, and see that and understand that. And so there'll be a different kind of perspective. Um, we'd also in both of these plans, just, just uh, as long as I'm talking about them, uh, just note, would have far better diversity of uh, geography and uh, pedigree and law school background and, and these kinds of things. Um, you know, note that we uh, have a, a court that are all people who went to Harvard and Yale. Uh, uh, I think everyone on the court- That, is that was my next question. Catholic, Anglican, or, uh, mm -hmm. or Jewish. Um, there's not much religious diversity. There's not much racial, I mean, there's, there's a wide variety of backgrounds of corporate lawyers versus public defenders, all of that kind of thing. Um, if you move to these kind of systems where you have to pull from the Court of Appeals, you'll get people with a variety, wide variety of practice backgrounds, geographic backgrounds, uh, you know, who you interact with. Um, you know, uh, if we were all here in person, uh, you know, Judge Strange would be, uh, you know, interacting with lots of people who practice in different things here in, in Nashville. Uh, not what you see if you are just sitting in Washington, D.C. the whole time uh, and hobnobbing at, at cocktail parties in Georgetown. Um, so very different kind of experiences people would bring to the bench uh, on those two systems. Ed, go ahead. Oh, um, the, the only other thing I was going to ask about was the geographic diversity. Um, you hark back to ages ago when circuits flowed into the Supreme Court so that you had national um, representation on the Supreme Court. And I wondered if there was any intentionality in looking at um, geographic diversity. Perhaps your plan, Ganesh, would, would do that and also have the, a serious benefit of opening up what has become a very closed system of feeder judges from the same schools, from the same geographic location, um, which I think for the, for the joining of all the parts of our nation together in a true democracy, you need to open that system up. And, and rather than opening, I think it is moving more and more toward a closed system, um, completely closed, to be, um, you know, beginning with the clerking. It starts there and it moves all the way up, keeping its system closed and um, reinforcing the power of big law and big law schools. Let me, let me piggyback on that uh, for you, Ganesh. Um, as a Midwesterner, uh, I, I share the, those concerns. And also the idea that all of our justices are former are judges. Uh, what about other life experiences? I, I tell you, that troubles me as a, certainly somebody that admired uh, people like Earl Warren and Justice Douglas and others. There's, there's not just one. And Justice Brandeis. Uh, and Justice Brandeis. I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and, and this is a big, uh, you know, this is a big question too. You know, we've seen a systematic moving toward um, people who've served as judges, uh, but to the extent they, that some of our justices have experience in politics, uh, it is as staffers in White Houses or in the Department of Justice. Um, and we've often had some of those. So been attorneys general have often gone on to be Supreme Court justices. Uh, heads of OLC, solicitor general. I mean, people have these kind of jobs and they go on to become justices. Um, uh, but what's really not been in the, in the mix in recent uh, decades, really, um, is anyone who's actually had a run for an office before um, or be in a legislature and interact and deal with the political pressures that you see. And uh, if a large chunk of what judges are doing 
is reviewing the constitutionality or interpreting statutes, um, maybe uh, it would be helpful for some of them to have thought about how the statute gets made and understood what some of those pressures look like and, and have experienced that. Um, but instead, we don't really have people since Sandra, I mean, Sandra Day O'Connor, I think was the last one. Uh, she'd served as a state legislature, but uh, a state legislator, but, but way back there were, there were many more um, who had had kind of serious electoral experiences, either as governors or senators or, uh, or, or in other roles in, in, in political life. Looks like by the end of the weekend, there's a chance Indiana will have had two, two members. So, <laughs> I don't know how the judge reacts to that. So I'm going to combo um, two questions that came in for the sake of time. Um, one is to gather thoughts on um, the case regarding subjecting the president to the state of criminal or civil charges, particularly on the subpoena of tax returns. So just your thoughts on that. And then the other is if you have a sense of what issues the court will start prioritizing through cert positions. Um, so l let me take the second one. I don't know if, uh, if, if Russ, you wanna talk a little bit about the, the first uh, po topic as a general matter, um, uh, but I could as, as well. Um, on the second one, you know, I think one thing that we have seen in recent years, um, and the data bears this out, is that the the Supreme Court um, is taking a lot of cases from uh, trade associations that are corporate um, business interests, uh, and um, and uh, I'd say sort of uh, the more ideologically conservative aligned activist. Uh, organizations um, or groups uh, that, that bring cases. Um, um, and, and so that, that's been a shift that's happened. Um, you can see this in, in cert petitions and in win rates as well. Um, now, that could be a selection problem. You know, in theory, you might say, uh, well, maybe there's just more unconstitutional things happening that those groups are concerned about. Um, but you might also think that uh, you know, what the justices are deciding they want to look at are things that those kind of groups are bringing um, because they want to move in a certain uh, direction. So, you know, I would expect that we would continue to see that trend, that we get more uh, kind of push in a, a uh, kind of Lochnerian uh, pro-business corporate um, direction, um, uh, more on the First Amendment especially, which has really been a major site of some of those changes. Um, so, so th in the constitutional space, um, those are a couple of places where, where I'd, I'd look uh, carefully. Russ, do you have anything or are we, I'll give you the last thought if you have something. If not, I'll close yeah. out and... If I could, I just wanted to ask Anish, if somebody serves as a justice for, for two weeks, when they come back to the Court of Appeals, for how long do the other judges have to call them justice? Well, they're all appointed in, in our system. They'd all be appointed associate justices. So the answer is they could go around oh, calling each other justice. Uh, it'll be like that old scene. And I think it was Spies Like Us. Um, if anyone's seen that movie, doctor, 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 doctor. Uh, <laughs> they can all call themselves justices and and have a great time with uh, with, with their new titles. I mean, you know, and, and, and a, uh, it's really a, some, you know, in our paper um, and in our kind of popular advocacy for this, it's not something that we have, focused on, but um, this would be a promotion for every court of appeals judge uh, to associate justice of the Supreme Court in terms of their, their title and position and, and resume. And uh, so I think um, it should find some favor, uh, at least with, with that constituency. Thank you, Peggy. <laughs> Fantastic. I just wanted to go ahead and on behalf of the national chapter, thank everyone so much for coming. This was a great talk. I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did as well. And um, we have some upcoming events. We're still planning on them, but once we have them finalized, we'll be sending them out to everyone. So hopefully you can attend events with us in the future or let us know if you have any events you would like for us to host. And you can reach out to me and I'll have Peggy put my email or Callie or co my co-president or co-chair. So right now, I hope that some of you will stay on the line to mingle with the other guests. We're trying to at least have some of the experience from the in-person events and we'll ask they're going to move us into smaller breakout groups and once you enter the room we encourage you to introduce yourself give your name employer just a short description of your work 
And then we hope that you'll discuss what you think is the best way to handle a potential Supreme Court nomination pre or post confirmation. So we're gonna, we were gonna shuffle two times, but it might be once, we'll see how the time goes, but hang on if you wanna do some mingling with other people. With that, I will um, place you into uh, breakout rooms and we'll bring everyone back at the end. Enjoy.